Paul is a director of projects at the Sustainable Preservation Initiative. He's both an archaeologist, having carried out field work in the Middle East, South, Af South America, and West Africa, and a community business developer. Burton Shaw studied archaeology at the University of Cambridge before working for several archaeology tour companies. He became interested in the economics of cultural heritage after witnessing the public desire for archaeology and the challenges of preservation and local benefits firsthand. He later completed his MA and PhD in using cultural heritage as a sustainable development resource at University College London. SPI's methodology, which is the umbrella organization we're talking about today, of community development was developed by Burton Shaw and has recently been adopted by the United Nations. And I would also ask that Paul's been involved with many of our AMR projects and is now a judge as well the last couple of years in the AMR program. So he's, he's he, you know, he's somebody you want to get to know because he might be evaluating your project when you do that, either this year or next. So Paul, let me take it away to you. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, good morning everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming along and hearing about this. Humanity's past is our cultural memory. Um, it tells us where we've come from, but also provides ins uh, inspiration of where we're going. But also, it's a huge economic asset for people today. Um, it, heritage tourism is a crucial part of many countries' GDP and a critical uh, source of foreign exchange. To give some examples, um, in the UK, about a third of tourists come to that country for heritage tourism alone. And it's estimated that the cultural heritage of that country is worth about 50 billion pounds, so $70 billion, um, which is more than the advertising industry, the film industry, or the car industry. Um, it's estimated that tourism to the top 500 sites in the developing world will be worth about $100 billion by 2025. So our past is a huge economic asset. And most of that economic value comes from tourism, like to the side of Chichen Itza here. Um, in Mexico, you can see the vast amount of tourists that <laughs> go there pretty much every day. Um, but that economic value is also generated through uh, urban regeneration projects using historic properties in urban cores to attract uh, businesses and people. Um, it comes from jobs created with conservation and uh, academic research projects around cultural heritage. It's used in cultural branding, using ancient imagery um, as part of businesses and other initiatives. Just taking a cheesy example, the Luxor Hotel, Hotel in Las Vegas trades on ancient cultural imagery. It doesn't pay for it, but it trades on it. Um, Egypt tried to actually sue them for it, but it didn't work. Um, and finally, money is generated through the legal and unfortunately illegal uh, looting of sites for sales in the antiquity market. So there's huge economic value in these sites. However, unfortunately, some of the um, world's poorest communities live adjacent to some of the world's most significant heritage sites. And reality is that these communities, who are the ones that interact with these sites every day, are the ones that are most often missing out on the economic opportunities and the business uh, opportunities that these sites can represent. The economic flows tend to go to national governments, to international businesses, to middlemen, those which have more of the skills and resources to take advantage of the economic opportunities that cultural heritage offer. And the local populations miss out on these opportunities, but they, also, but they get most of the costs. They get the activity of tourism, the pollution, the traffic that might come with it. They get restrictions on their access to the space. They are sometimes removed from the space for tourism or other activities at the sites. Um, and they have um, restrictions on their behavior around cultural heritage. They might not be able to use those sites anymore. So they get little of the benefits, but a lot of the costs. And also, these great cultural sites are under threat. Um, there's widespread destruction of cultural heritage sites around the world. Uh, let me give you just some statistics for context. Um, in Peru, they've lost more sites in the last 20 years than they had in 400 years before that. 85% of known sites in Guatemala are already affected by looting. In Egypt, if current trends continue, all sites in Egypt will be compromised um, by looting or other uh, conservation threats to those sites by 2040, if nothing changes. Um, 
And while ISIS has grabbed the headlines in recent years with their deliberate destruction of sites, the reality that is the vast majority of destruction to sites is caused by entirely preventable reasons. And these two problems, the destruction of sites and, uh, and the uh, needs of local communities are not unrelated problems. Local communities often don't have the incentive to look after the sites or, uh, more importantly, the economic choice to do so. They have land around them uh, which has these sites on. They need to use those land, that land for other reasons, uh, even if it is destructive. That might be grazing, that might be growing crops on land, that might be building residential or commercial properties on the land, it might be taking material from sites, stones, and building their own houses with it. Often you talk to communities and they're like, why would I go buy stone? There's a huge pile of it sitting right there. It's nice stone. They take it and they build their own properties. They may loot the sites uh, to sell on the, uh, on the international market, taking materials from there. And it's a little bit incongruous of us to go ask these communities who are facing survival needs to not use the land and this asset around them because we find them of scientific value. Um, so ultimately, the biggest problem facing both communities and these sites is poverty. That's the ultimate challenge for both these, um, both these assets. Um, so, but communities and sites can help each other. The solution is to find economic opportunities, economic strategies that can mutually benefit both sites and communities. We have to find ways of having cultural heritage become a sustainable, useful asset to the communities so that it's alive in their current lives, in the way they live today. I've had the good fortune of a large part of my life to be an archaeologist. I've traveled the world. I've excavated in quite a lot of countries, ancient settlements and temples. And it's been a lot of fun. Um, a lot of what I've done in my work is work with communities and archaeologists to find those solutions. How can what we find um, in the ground and on sites for archaeology, how can that benefit communities and how can communities work positively with sites? So now I work for the Sustainable Preservation Initiative. And what we do is build futures and save past. So we're a US-based uh, nonprofit uh, organization. And what we do is we create economic opportunities around cultural heritage sites for local communities. So we give communities the tools they need to leverage their historic sites responsibly that, so that they can be empowered to look after their heritage, grow their own economic opportunities, and help them thrive as communities. So I think the best example of what we do is best illustrated by what inspired our founder, this handsome chap, Larry Coburn here, um, I set up the organization. So Larry had a successful corporate career in the energy sector. He still uh, works as part of that uh, sector as well. Um, but he's always had a passion for archaeology. And you can, um, you can hear his TED talk um, online on our website, which explains his transition here and some of the stories I'm going to tell you. So Larry had a career change um, to become an archaeologist. And he started excavating at this site um, in Cayata in Bolivia. So this site is one of the largest, or would have been one of the largest, roof structures in the ancient Incan Empire, which covered most of the South America, or most of the Andes of the South American continent. Um, so he started working there. The community that lives around the site today mainly subsist on less than a dollar a day. It's a poor rural community. And unfortunately, that community were slowly destroying the site. Not out of malice, they just needed, they needed to use the land. So they were grazing uh, animals around the land, growing crops. And most usefully for them, they were using the inside of the building as a soccer pitch. So if you're up a mountain at 10,000 feet, having walls which keep the ball in your building is extremely useful. So that's what they were using the building for. So Larry was talking to the local community. He was suggesting that they wanted to look after it because it's super important and significant archaeological. And 
if you have any experience telling local communities what's important for them, they didn't take too kindly for that. They nod their heads and go, aha, uh -huh, but nothing changed. So Larry tried a new tactic. He said, OK, how about this? The site gets a small trickle of tourists that come from a town about three hours away um, in Bolivia. So he said, let's put a gate on the road. Only one road in, so let's put a gate on it. If Bolivians come, it's free, no problem. If a foreigner comes, $10 to get in and visit the site. And the local people were like, there's no way someone's going to pay the equivalent of two weeks wages to visit this site. Larry was a little bit more confident, so he said, tell you what, I'll pay for the gate, and I'll pay for a few weeks' wages of somebody to stand there and collect the money of whoever comes along. OK, so in week one, they got four tourists. In week two, they got three more tourists who all paid, and I don't, I'm sure you can all do the maths there. At $70, that's a pretty good return on investment of $50 that he paid for the gate and for the wages. And not only was it an economic success, it transformed the view of the site in the community's mind. Um, the first thing they did with the money was buy out the people who were grazing their animals on this land and growing crops. And they used the money to build a soccer pitch somewhere else in their community. Um, and then they started asking Larry independently about to have more information about the site. They wanted to know what was happening, what he was finding, because in their eyes, this place had been transformed into something that was of value to the community, that's something they could use and contributed to their lives today. So Larry, so this was in 2009, 2010, and Larry took this strategy and built the Sustainable Preservation Initiative to spread that around the world. Now we work in six different countries, doing 20 different projects um, of all different sorts all around the world. So. I'll give you an example now of what one of the projects we've been doing now. So this is Pachacamac, a world heritage site that's outside of Lima, the capital of Peru. Um, it's a great site. It's an enormous site. It has about 16 pyramids in it, numerous painted temples. And what it was was an oracle site. So it was an oracle uh, was here for about 1,400 years. People would come from all over the Andes to, to consult the oracle, get healed. So huge place, extremely significant. Um, but the site also has a migrant community living around it. A lot of people who have come from the mountains in Peru down to the coast to look for opportunities near the capital. And this is an unofficial, informal settlement lacking in public in infrastructure, lacking in economic opportunities. And that lack of resources has meant tensions within the community, a lot of infighting. And one of the ways to gain new resources was um, land developers would organize the community. They would break down the walls of the edge of the site that they live by and then occupy it. Um, and it was a big job to, to reclaim the land from them um, uh, by the site, they had to call the police um, and remove the people from the land. So the local site museum wanted to improve relations with the community, wanted to do something about this conservation problem and help the community. So they started, they talked to us and we put together a project. So beginning in uh, early 2014, we worked with the local museum to collect together a group of 23 women from the different communities around the site for over a year. They received uh, training in business skills and production skills. They worked with the archaeologists on the site to learn about the history of the site and the art of the site and gain inspiration from it. We also built them um, space on the site so they could meet um, somewhere neutral, away from their communities, and they could bond together as a group. And the business that we created was one that would sell souvenirs to tourists um, that were based on the local art, art iconography of the site. So you can see here some of the woven products they came up with, which incorporates some of that painted iconography we see um, on the temples. And then our first sales began in early 2015. So in 2015, the um, business made about $10,000. 2016, about 16,000. 2017, we got up to about 20,000. And already in 2018, we've just about got past um, our 2017 total in about seven months. Um, so this business has taken off rapidly. Um, the women, um, we have 23 women um, and one man in the group, and they call themselves Sisan, which means to flower in the local Quechua language. 
a, something that they came up with that they wanted to represent them and the efforts they were making. This business now is completely self-managed. The women run it, they organize themselves, they do everything. We, in terms of revenues, in just over three years, the revenues to the project overtook the amount of the grant that we had put into it. So it was about three years to return on investment on what we'd put in in the project. Um, and now the women go out and get their own contracts. Most recently, they've started working with the airline LATAM, um, big South American airline, and they recycle the old uniforms of the crew um, into products which are then sold on site and sold online. This is all them. We, do not, we no longer support them. They're a sustainable, independent business. And the women per hour earn above Peru's minimum wage, um, which is often not applied in most businesses in Peru. Um, so economically, uh, a great success uh, for these women. But the success has not just been in terms of the raw economic figures um, for the business. We've seen a transformation in the women themselves and their empowerment. Before um, the business started, most of these women hadn't, didn't have their own independent income, let alone had run a business. When you first met them, they were relatively shy and retiring. They'd faced a lot of machismo culture in their communities um, and hadn't had many opportunities, independent opportunities themselves. Now, when you visit them, they are the ones in front of TV cameras, pushing other people out of the way. They are the ambassadors for their community. And they meet um, real ambassadors and other people who come and see their project. They've really come out of their uh, shells. And they've got their own opportunities. One of the women got a scholarship for a local business school um, based on what she did in the project. Um, and to just read a quote from the, uh, one of our project managers, the director of the site museum, um, to see the way the women who came here years ago and were so timid feel about themselves and become empowered is an important achievement. For them, SPI and the Pashkamek Site Museum truly means improving their quality of life. No, and, and it also means knowing who they are and where they want to go. And the um, women themselves um, have said, one of the ladies said, we were just regular artisans or housewives, but here at CISAN, we have discovered who we truly are and have expanded our skills. Now we feel more important than before and we're able to provide for our households. So we've, these women now are independent business owners who have their own opportunities and able to control their own futures. And not just the transformation in the, in the women. Of course, part of the project is um, conservation aims. So now the, the site no longer has to call the police. The land invasions have stopped. Um, they haven't for the last two, three years needed to call the police for any site invasion. And as the women themselves have said, simple quote here, we knew about the site because we would walk by it, but now we value it. A simple transformation, they're now included in the site. It's a contemporary asset for their lives. So building on this success, we've also introduced a uh, bike hire and guiding scheme with local youth in the area. The women wanted opportunities for young people in the community as well. So tourists can now go hire bikes with local use and go around the large site um, with them. This not only provides crucial part-time work for local youth, but also because they're managing their own business, they get real experience which they can then use in future careers. And we've expanded that project to two other sites in Peru in the north. This is an example from one of those expansion sites. Um, and we're looking at doing more uh, in the future. So we have a wide variety of business models and projects around the world. So this is our weavers. Uh, we work to using a traditional uh, backstrap loom technique. Um, they make uh, textile products uh, using iconography from the site of Tortuna um, that you can see there, amazing burials that came out of this site. In Guatemala, we've partnered with an international NGO to create um, a collection of jewelry. Uh, which is based on the mine site of Camino Huyu, using the inspiration from that. And this jewelry gets made by local women and survivors of domestic abuse, and then is exported around the world. Um, so you can buy it online. It was sold at Target last year, but you can go buy it online now if you want. Um, it's called Rebirth Camino Huyu. It's a really nice collection. In uh, Tanzania, we started working with women's group um, at the site of Keola um, on the coast. 
And these women are now building a business where they're selling food and drink to visitors of that site. Um, and they're collecting local shellfish that come from the coast, um, turning it into soups and other food for um, the visitors. But they're also using that same uh, food stuff to sell to the capital and they're looking at exporting it internationally as well. So just from that small market, they're expanding it to other places. In Jordan, uh, near the site of Petra, uh, we are working with the local community to develop a business which is training local people in conservation and archaeological services, which normally go to foreign teams. But we, because there's a lot of this activity at Petra, teams can come in and employ local people to do those jobs, having local people access higher paid and higher skilled work through formal qualifications. So we're working with that project to understand their business model and check it can be a sustainable, viable uh, model for the future. In Bulgaria, um, we are helping local people um, develop entrepreneurship opportunities, leveraging their local medieval Byzantine history. There's 12 fortresses in this area, so they've made a logo based on that, and they're making products they're selling to tourists and other, to, into other markets um, to support local entrepreneurship. So our ability to do these projects and be successful like we have been in Patrick Kamak ultimately relies on our ability to create sustainable and viable community businesses. That's what it comes down to. Although we work a lot with cultural heritage, a large part of what I do is actually developing sustainable startups in communities. Um, and what we are aiming to do, those businesses need to be viable in the, in the sense they have a robust business model, but also produce jobs that, are, that pay well um, and um, are going to be long term for the people. And it needs to be sustainable in the way that the community themselves have the skills and the ability to run that business themselves. They need to be independent from us and be able to control that business and make their own decisions over the long term. So that's what we are um, aiming for. And as we've been doing this over the last eight, ten years, um, we've learned a number of lessons. And I'm sure some of these lessons will be familiar to you. Um, but we'll go over and see what's crucial to our approach. And I think the starting point for all of us is that all our strategies will be community-based and small scale. So we always start from the point of view of what is happening in this community, what are their social structures, what works with um, how they see themselves and see what they want, and what works with their motivations. That's a crucial point. You can't go into a community and expect them to want the same things you do. Some of our projects that we work with start off being ambitious, but they only want a certain level of income, and we have to respect that. So they are in control. We work with existing cultural contacts. We're trying to be culturally sensitive, because if you're not, things quite simply do not work. The second main thing we try and do is work with women. Um, and there are many reasons to, for that, not simply because, as I'm sure you'll all recognize, they are better business people. Um, but statistics have shown that working with women in communities the money that they earn tends to be more retained in that community, helping that community. Um, in a lot of the places we work, women are excluded from economic opportunities. And that's one of the main social structures we do aim to change, um, is empowering women and giving them the opportunities that they might be excluded from in their communities. Another more practical reason is that a lot of the businesses we work with take time to develop. Um, Men in a lot of communities go from work to work and aren't in a position to sit to do months of training on developing a business, where women tend to be able to do that. So we find work with women not only is more transformative, but leads to better success in our projects. The third thing, um, and I'll tell you a quick sorry, story about work with women. We, in our project in Guatemala, we were visiting our participants and talking to them. And the husband of one of the uh, participants was there. And he got up and wanted to speak in the meeting. And he said, when this project first started, I was very skeptical about my wife being part of this. He was like, I, I didn't want her being outside the house. I didn't want to come home and the house be not tidy and my dinner not be ready. I didn't want her working part of it. But he eventually agreed that she, she could be part of the project. And then, after a few months, when the money started coming into the household, he 
changed his mind, and he was saying, and he, the, word, the term he used was, my own Berlin Wall fell down. So he realized, why am I excluding my wife from doing these things? This, what's the problem? So now he's the one who goes and persuades other husbands, like, you know, it's good. Go let your wife do this. It's, this, it's great. Go, go do it. So we have seen real examples of that change in mentality, which has opened up opportunities for people. Um, and the third thing about working with people is local leadership. We're aware, as an international NGO, we have teams in each country we work, but we want that leadership and empowerment as local as possible. Um, so we make sure that all our projects ha are driven locally. There's people who are empowered to drive those projects locally. The motivation and, and leadership comes at a local level, and that's critical for success. The next thing is a clear market. Especially um, in kind of my field, work with cultural heritage and in some ways natural heritage, a lot of projects that are well-meaning and they set up maybe tourism operations or people making local products and they make lovely places to visit or lovely and teach people to make nice things, but they don't have a clear market. They don't have anyone to sell to. They just concentrate on the production. Um, and then they might work for a year or two, but then just simply slowly die because they haven't got a robust business plan. So when we're approaching projects, we always have a kind of business hat on. We look at them like venture capital, venture capitalist, and that we must have a clear market and a good business plan before we start. Otherwise, we're just raising false expectations. We support projects through grants. Uh, we don't have a stake or anything like that. But in a way, we pretend we do so that we know what we're investing in has a decent chance of being economically successful. Um, secondly, and that's one of the reasons we do a lot of artisan businesses, um, because if you do tourism businesses, it's difficult to really impact the tourist market and get more visitors uh, to your site. But with artisan businesses, you can sell to tourists and you can sell to other uh, markets. So we're always looking for our products to have multiple markets so that if there's a bad tourism season or you know politics changes, that their business can be robust and sustainable. The second thing is resources. Our businesses typically take two or three years to be set up and get going to a point where they're sustainable. We have to be with that business all the way through, supporting them, being mentors. We have to make sure they have the right startup capital. We have to make sure they have access to the right uh, experts that they can rely on and call up and ask for help to help them develop as they grow their own skills and knowledge. We can't start a project unless we know we can support that through to the end. Um, and then the real key of this is building real business skills that the participants themselves have. We've experienced a lot of projects where we have gone in and the locals have shown us grants they've received before where they have a lovely building that's usually full of some sewing machines um, and they've been taught to make something and they're like, we, we don't have the skills, we, we don't know how to find markets to, 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 to take the products we know how to make too. They don't have the skills of self-management or anything like this. So we have to make sure that our participants get those core business skills so that they can become independent of us and manage their own businesses. So we've taken our experience and those strategies, we've made what's called the SPI, Business School and Capacity Building process. So all our participants get taken for a mini business school. Um, and the document that is the SPI business school has two main functions. The first is for project managers. It acts as a guide to take somebody through how to build a community business, what to look out for, what the steps they should take, how to know whether to go forward, um, how basically to create that business. And the second side is a materials for, for people to teach communities those business skills. Um, so we'll go through that, um, what I mean by that. So this is the kind of very overview, very kind of big picture idea of, of how we um, talk project managers and other people through our approach. So we start off with diagnostics, usually one to three months of somebody being in the field with a community, visiting them a few times. Um, and in this stage, we are, people are collecting the basic information to understand whether a project could be successful there. And the main thing they're looking out for is 
an accessible market? Is there somebody, is there a group of people, a market somewhere we can sell something to? Is there a motivated community? Do the local people want this? Because if not, there's no point going any further. Third, is there effective local leadership? Uh, can we work through someone here? Who's that going to be? Do they have a good record? And we're also at this stage looking at what capacities the local community have, what skills they already have, and therefore what will be crucial to teach them to launch a business in that area. Oh, sorry. The second aspect is viability. Again, usually a few, one to three months where we are building the business plan of what we're going to do. Um, so we are talking to experts, we are figuring out our costs and supply chain, we are doing the basic back of the envelope numbers to understand whether those in initial business ideas you might have ahead are viable and are going to work. And the other thing we're doing at this stage is starting to talk more to the local community, identify who our exact participants are going to be, what their motivations are, what goals they have in their head, and making sure the business is matching what the motivations and ideas the local community have are. Thirdly, it's capacity. This is the main training phase of a project. Um, we don't want it to be any more than six months long because we find that in, if it's any longer, local people lose interest and lose trust that you're going to deliver a business that's actually going to bring them income. So we aim for this to be three to six months long. And this is the phase where we are teaching people how to make the product or do a certain service, the basic business skills to manage themselves and make that service. Um, and at the end of this phase will be selling. We have to get this to the point where we have to bring in income and sell our service or product at the end. And then we're looking at sustainability. If we have those first successful sales, how do we build sustainability into the business? So we're going through cycles of evaluation, what's working, what's not, are they managing themselves, are not, what's selling, adjusting the business, new products, retraining and things, um, seeing how that goes, and we go through this cycle a few times. And while those cycles develop, at first, the project managers and outsiders may be guiding the local people more and talking them through that evaluation. By the second or third time you do that, it's the local people themselves that are evaluating things and making decisions about what they want to do with their business. And that can take a year or longer of just working with them, tweaking things, and they grow and gain experience. And then finally, a really important step is independence. It's stepping away from the business, changing your relationship with the business so they're no longer relying on you. And you might become a mentor, you might sit on an informal board, you might still help them get retail channels and markets, but you are stepping back so that business can be independent. And this is the kind of, when we talk our uh, our own project managers through and other people interested in setting up these kind of businesses, what to look for at each stage and how to implement it. And the other side of the business school is teaching these business skills. Now we work on eight uh, areas which we think are crucial to any business. A business must have skills in each of these eight areas to actually succeed. So we have management, your internal management and capability of managing your people, formalization, registration, paying taxes, being um, a business on paper, design of your product and services, the actual delivery and production of that, packaging and transportation, making sure things get to the market in a good condition and are displayed well, your branding and identity, what's the story you're telling through your products, marketing, who are your market, what do they want, understanding them, and finally, where are you selling and how are you selling um, your goods. So we make sure that all our businesses ha are competent in each of these areas. Um, and we do that through workshops like this. I know it's difficult to read, but it's just an example of one that's uh, in the business school, one of the early ones, which is basically, what is a business? Um, and these workshops can be taught by somebody in the country um, who usually our local champion or a project manager, somebody like that, who can sit down and work with the community here. They are aimed to be at... Uh, taught to people with low literacy or can be adapted for illiterate people. Um, they are designed to be adapted for local circumstances, local examples. There's always their gaps in saying you need to include a local example here. So it's always tailored to, um, tailored to local people. Um, and they're designed to be easy to implement and easy to teach. And these are the, just a quick overview of the type of lessons we teach and how we do that. So at the beginning, we're starting with Simple ideas of what is a business? 
What do you want out of this? What kind of business that we together want to create? Um, and because some people who have, a lot of people don't think they can be entrepreneurs or business people, that it's something for somebody else. So this is a lot about breaking down those barriers and encouraging people and giving them the confidence that this is something that they can do. Stage three, as I was talking about this main capacity stage, this is about the basic skills you need to run a business. So we're looking at organization, how to keep records, how to um, solve problems, uh, how to write receipts, how to price things, these kind of basic building blocks of a business. And then in stage four, we are moving towards of the kind of softer skills of business, how to evaluate yourselves, how to do market research, how to deal with change, how to make decisions about growth. So as we go through the lessons, we're giving the, the participants more and more responsibility. It's very difficult at the beginning to ask people to decide on their market. People don't have the skills. These are the harder skills at the end. So we take a lot of responsibility at the beginning and then work together and hand over that responsibility to the participants as they take over their business. And again, we find the whole thing takes about uh, two or three years to go through. And we are constantly trying to improve this business school and produce um, happy results like these ladies uh, in Peru. And we're expanding our methodology around the world. We are, as we do so, we are finding key lessons in different countries. And we take those lessons and incorporate them back into our strategies, tell other countries about them. We're constantly learning. And we're also learning from people who don't necessarily work with cultural heritage. A lot of the lessons that we do, we have and our strategies apply to any sort of business. So at the moment, we've begun a collaboration with the um, United Nations Office of Project Services. So to help uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises, and particular female-led uh, enterprises, to develop their business capacity so they can qualify to provide services to UN products, uh, UN projects. Sorry. Um, so we're working on workshops for those enterprises um, and using our materials to develop their business capacity around the world. And so that's also part of this uh, presentation is to put it out to you guys of saying, well, what other models are there for us to learn from? Uh, where can this sort of approach be applied? Um, and what other examples would be useful to us to know about? Um, we need help um, in terms of testing this methodology, learning more. Uh, how can we improve our strategy? How can we improve our workshops so that we can teach these skills better? Because uh, it's the bedrock of our success in our projects. How do we improve the pedagogy of what we do? How do we improve the content? How do we make it um, better for different countries? So now or afterwards, I'd welcome anyone's thoughts on that. Anything you'd like to share, we're very open to sharing what we have and hearing from other people. And now I'd welcome any questions anyone has. Thank you very much. Um, so as we started and we're finishing, I, you know, again, it just strikes me that there's so much in this to unpack with cultural sensitivity, economic development, even some issues around gender, which is kind of fascinating with this model. Mm. So I'm going to start with two quick questions because I know we're short on time. One is, you, you've worked in a variety of different regions. How do you look at um, you know, where this has worked well, and where are there regions that's a counterpoint to that where maybe it hasn't worked as well? Or have you experienced that yet as an organization? We've definitely experienced difference between countries we worked in. Um, we've recently started working in Bulgaria, where um, gender is less of an issue. Um, as, a, as part of uh, an ex-Soviet regime, there was full employment, which included women. So the concentration there is not on confidence for employment and breaking down those barriers, it tends to be more on entrepreneurship. So that's a different context. And while it applies to all countries, one of the um, differences we see is there are some contexts where there's a lot of development and aid money that communities receive. And so they've, it's relatively easy to access. So then coming with a project where they are responsible, they are growing something from themselves, that's actually quite a, different obstacle, a difficult obstacle to get over because the communities can, their sustainability is getting grant after grant after grant. So changing that mindset. So there are definitely places where that's a problem. And that's some of the differences we're seeing. And have you worked in any African countries so far? We've just, um, in the last year, we started in Tanzania. Um, and that's been really 
interesting experience there. Um, a lot of good entrepreneurship skills, actually, amongst local people. Um, working with, we concentrate on working with women there. And they've, um, similar, actually, to Latin America, they've come out and kind of grabbed those opportunities. And we find work with women in that country really working. Um, they, Africa and South America, very broadly, have had similar challenges. But then the Middle East and Southeast Europe, that's where some of these different contexts have come in. Jordan and others places you've been. Yeah. And then um, one of the big things we see in general for any of the developing country context, and actually for any social enterprise in general, is the concept of you know what is the role of government. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure politics has a huge impact and not only on conservation and commitment to conservation, but just on economic development in general. And, and so how do you how do you look at your influence in that and, and your role with influencing government bodies as you look at these mm -hmm. different countries? Well, exactly as you. Um, suspect the, the political situation is very different from country to country. Some governments are very supportive of what we do, or more particularly, a minister might be important in what we do, and then halfway through the project, they change. And because our projects take several years to come to fruition, we have to make sure actually we're relatively independent from local politics. We really want their support, but we have to make sure we're not relying on it because if a minister changes, then we can't rely on their ongoing political support. And towards preservation, some countries are extremely protect protective of their archaeological sites, and for good reason. And they're very, they build a big wall around their sites and want to protect what's inside, and aren't very keen on interacting with communities who have traditionally farmed that land and been seen as destructive influences on it. So in some countries, we're able to change that mindset, particularly on a local level. We find we have individuals in places who get it, and want to work with local communities. And there are true stars, those kind of local champions who can then make things happen. And they're, the, a lot of the time, the people we look out for. And they guide us through the politics. But in other places, yeah, they, the politics gets in the way. And we have to say sometimes, we can't work here. They're like, yeah. I know, I know it's Sanergy, which is um, a case I've written. And they, mm -hmm. do, they work in Kenya in sanitation. But right. you know, they went through a whole regime change during that period of time, and it was very confusing, land rights, land ownership, and yeah. they now have a lot of people within the organization committed to really working with the government, yeah. and that's part of their job um, yeah. on, on site. So I wanted to open up to, to you all and see what questions you might have. Yes. And make sure you say your name, too, just so we can all uh, I'm Marianne. Um, how do you get the funding for these projects? So. A lot of our funding comes from donors uh, in the US. We've also um, had very successful collaborations with National Geographic uh, recently, who are big supporters of what we do, particularly the bike schemes in Peru and um, the projects in Tanzania um, that we're starting up. So our core um, comes from donors and philanthropy, but uh, increasingly we are working with other organizations that share our preservation goals and community goals and job creation goals um, together on projects. Yes. Uh, my name is Schaefer. Um, and uh, my question is, who's the market for that SPI business school uh, that you guys are, um, I guess, like teaching or giving mm -hmm. to these social entrepreneurs? And then what is SPI's relationship with the uh, recipient or student of that business school? Does, does that automatically like make their project one of SPI's initiatives? Do you guys just kind of give the lessons and then it's, it's hands off or it's the relationship there? Primarily, um, well, that's one of the things that the market for a business school is one of the things we're developing. Um, we've developed this material through our own experience and for the first step for our own projects to kind of formalize our approach and then use it as a tool for all our different countries. But because we're finding it's useful beyond our own projects, we are talking to a variety of organizations who might want to take our material um, and use them in their own projects. Um, we are working with people in country to say, well, we can use this material for your projects uh, too. And different partners have different needs uh, from that material. So they'll have different outputs. So within our own project, when we accept a project and we say, you know, this is an SPI project. We make sure our participants get that training. But then we are, at the moment, in a phase of seeing where else we can use that material. And that's part of talking to, to you guys and seeing where can we use this material? Where is this useful? How do we work with a wider business 
um, environment to see where we fit in, what we can learn, and where we can be useful. So that's, a, that's an open question. Basically. You know, follow up on Schaefer's question, mm -hmm. you, you all have a relationship with the United Nations, and certainly with the work you're doing fits into several right. of the SDGs. So, I mean, have you looked at a collaboration with them to incorporate some of this material as best practices for other organizations? That's, yeah, we're at the early stages of thinking about that. So, um, as we've been talking to people and sharing this material, we've got good feedback and good interest. And it's now about seeing how we fit in, how we use that. So that's exactly working with SDGs and having that framework out there is useful for us to be able to show that we can contribute to that. But we're still in the stage of working out the mechanics and the practicalities of how we work with people and in what way. So it's an exciting time to see us as SPI being in that space. And we're still trying to figure out where we are. So any opportunities and any ideas people have are very welcome. Thanks, go ahead. My name is Amanda. I have a um, question about, do you ever uh, run into local opposition against the commercialization of these sites? Specifically, I was working in Cyprus before this, and we had restored as donors a lot of churches. Okay. And people were really opposed to making money off of their... Yeah, and the, and the TED Talk that your founder did mm. gave a great example when he started first charging at the gate. And right. People, first of all, are saying nobody's going to pay for things, and then secondly, like, oh, yeah. you know, and some ethics around how much do you charge, and uh, and made it free to the community, right? So right. that you didn't get that um, the community exactly. having to suddenly pay. But yes, and there are lots of places around the world where there are relationships with cultural heritage and sites where people do not want to make money from them, um, that there are other values they hold for their sites, so they feel like a commercialization clashes with that. We find that that is a small minority of places, and even that, and in most cases, we can build a business sensitively. So we are always working, that's why we try to get leadership as local as possible, so that we spend that time in the beginning understanding what those motivations are, what ways we can commercialize something which then does benefit certain parts of the community, and how do we do that being sensitive to um, parts of other communities or other values they hold? So we do, at the beginning, spend a lot of time talking through those issues, and it might be that in certain places it, it doesn't work, that our model doesn't work, and that's fine, because it's the community that ultimately decides um, the suitability of a project. Um, but there are certain ways of doing it, especially if you're not bringing tourists directly in. We work with some very conservative places where opening up to tourism and inviting busloads of people in is not going to be a very good idea. But we can talk to them and say, well, do you want to use art from your, you know, what are you inspired by? Can we create products then that we would sell somewhere else? And again, gender comes into that. Gender roles um, of what people are happy. Usually, in a lot of countries we work with, women working as guides and interacting with foreign people tends to go against the grain, even though we don't want it to. Um, so it's understanding being that cultural sensitivity of how do we fit in here? What's our solution here? Does this work here? Um, and how? Yeah. Can I get a question, too? I'm Emily. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, one approach that I think is pretty interesting with conservation, I learned about in Rwanda this past summer. They're taking, this is an effort to conserve their national parks. They're taking the poachers and actually hiring right. them to be park guides. Mm. So I was wondering if you're leveraging any of the local opposition to kind of support your initiative. Sure. In a lot of these cases, um, us and other similar examples, you, the people who looted before are now the guides, are now the people who are running. Because a lot of the cases, the, for pragmatic reasons, the work we're offering them is better paid and more sustainable because you know, as a poacher or as a looter, the amount you're getting from the final sale price is hardly anything, you know. Um, and we're offering work which is much more, um, has much more value to them, much more dignity, um, and it's better paid. So, yeah, it's uh, that same idea of poacher turned gamekeeper applies to these projects as well. Um, as you saw in Bolivia, people who were unwittingly, in that case, damaging the site became their chief protectors. So, yeah, that transformation is part of what we're aiming for. And you're tying them deeper to the culture, too. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the things that they're selling or commerce they're creating are tied to ancient um, art artifacts yeah. that you all are discovering. So it, in, in effect, makes them closer to the community that they're part of or more connected it, it, to the history of yeah. those sites. Right? It, it often gives people, local people a way in to learn more. So that, that a project provides that 
doorway for them to be like, OK, this place is for us. Because often they barriers like it's a place for tourists or it's a place for cultured people to go. It's not our place. They want to break down those barriers. And once they feel comfortable in that space and talking about it, and they feel they have some sort of ownership, that's when they start asking questions and being like, well, tell me more. Because it's, it's for them then. It's not, and in lots of places around the world, what connects with local people is always different. And you have to be ready to tell the stories that matter to the local people rather than what, matter to, what matters to you as an archaeologist or something else. What matters to them, that's what you have to focus on. So I saw a hand here. Why don't I, I'm, I'm closer. Hi, my name is Neil. Thanks for being here. So my question is more related to disruption. So businesses get disrupted all the time, even the ones which are you know well established. So like uh, once these uh, businesses reach the independent stage, uh, what what are the things that you know? What resources do they have at their disposal to guard themselves from being disrupted mm -hmm. and constantly innovating and you know staying ahead of the game? Right. So like, uh, what are the things that maybe the business school has in its curriculum, or things that you know are yeah. helping them to ensure that they, uh, although they are independent and they are doing well right now, they continue doing so. Yeah, that's a good question. And a lot of what we try and build into the business skill are those immediate skills of self-evaluation, self-diagnostic, and coming up with their own strategies to adapt to a changing business environment. We know that the business we set up in the first year or two is not going to be the same business in five years' time. It has to change. So we make sure they have the skills to adapt to changing circumstances. Um, and also, we have had cases where um, other community businesses have been set up copying our business. And we have no problem with that, because it's supposed to be a community-based thing. If somebody comes up and another local person is able to copy what our business does, fantastic. There's more jobs that we created for free. Um, so yeah, it's really about providing people with those so that they can go and make their own decisions and sometimes mistakes, but they have a strong foundation with which to do so, and they're able to access help from elsewhere. And we're still there in the background as a mentor. Should they have real problems, they can always come and talk to us, and we can connect them up with other people that can take them further and develop their uh, businesses to the next level. So that wraps up our session. We're right thank at 12.30. I know some people are starting to leave, so I want to respect the time. I did want to make sure we thanked uh, Lucy Allard and uh, the Center for Global Management as well as the Costin uh, Institute of Archaeology. So, Bhavna? I just wanted to say one thing. Paul, did you have, um, would you like to present opportunities that you have for students to get involved with some of your work? That's right, yeah, jobs. Yeah, exactly. The, so Most the, importantly, let's get to the important stuff. The main um, asset we're reaching out to are if, if our materials appeal to you and this kind of creating um, teaching skills at this community level is something that appeals to you. We're looking for people to come in and just help us work on our materials and develop them, bring in expertise from other fields which we don't have ourselves and work with our materials to improve them. Um, we're open, we don't have a kind of set way of doing that. We're open to people coming and talking to us and we, especially with some of the opportunities of developing with the UN, we have uh, things that we can get you involved with, hopefully, and see how we develop that. The other side of this is places where our strategy might be applied. If you have projects somewhere which might use our uh, materials and or use our approach and test it, and then we can get lessons from that, that's fantastic uh, for us as well. So we are very much open to people contacting us, wanting to get involved, and we can structure opportunities as a result of that. So I'm personally a big fan of finding ways to contribute um, to economic development as well, your own personal economic development, as well as this organization's during the school year. There's no reason to wait all the way till next summer. So it sounds like we have your contact yes, information please there just to reach out. And maybe you can stick around for a few yeah, minutes. For people there's business cards out. outside on the table and a sign-up sheet. So just feel free to get in touch. I'm happy to talk to anyone about any aspect of this. Okay, well, thank you so much again. Thank you very much. Time.